the website that I've got projected in back of me is my website, and everything we're going to talk about today is written up on my website. So this introductory stuff is all on the website, and I wanted to be able to recognize the website, and if you go to articles, you'll see it says Architecture of the Soul, and you click on that, and that is what we're going to be covering today. But as you're thinking about what we said today, if you want to go back and refresh, that's the place to go because it's all written down there. As I have been saying for a while, the problem that we as people have to deal with, and everybody deals with it, is God chose not to make us perfect. That was a choice by God. He could have made us perfect if he wanted. For example, I have a computer in front of me. This computer does pretty much exactly what I tell it to do. I don't ever have my computer go into rebellion. Now, certainly it, you can have a mechanical malfunction or something like that, but basically the computer does what I tell it to do, and when I want it to do something, it does it. People are not that way. Had God wanted to make us that way, he was certainly capable of doing so. The fact that he chose not to is really important because much of Christianity spends a whole lot of time beating on you for being such an imperfect, lowly worm and all that kind of stuff. I will suggest to you that God made you imperfect, and the reason for that is he wants you to develop and grow into something else. The imperfections that we are all born with causes us to sin, and it causes problems in our life. Everybody here has got problems in their life. You've got problems with relationships. You've got problems with not being where you want to be. Everybody's got problems. Those problems are a function of the fact that we are made imperfect and we are dealing with other people who are also made imperfect. And the combination of that sometimes makes life really entertaining. I'm sure God has got a wonderful sense of humor. So the fact that we are not perfect is a feature not a bug. In other words, it is not a design flaw. It's the way God designed us. So get that welded into your head first and lose a whole bunch of guilt. Now, if by the end of your life you are still as imperfect as you were when you started, then you've screwed up. So one hopes that as you progress through this life, you will improve and you will correct your problems and you will get better and at the end of your life, the seed that you plant into the ground, which is this body, will have then the information for the resurrection body, as Matthew was talking about this morning, so that your resurrection body will be far more glorious than the one that you leave behind. That's how God designed us to be. So what we're going to do is, first off, recognize that God created you for a reason. You have a reason why you're here not just some cosmic accident. It's not, you know, that all of a sudden dirt got smart. Nothing like that, right? God created you for a reason. And he gave you a body. An integral part of why you were created is the body that you are part of. So the original set of folks was set here and told to tend the garden. Integral to what you are, that you have a body and you got stuff to do. You can either look at your imperfections as a source of shame, or you can look at your imperfections as the outline of a curriculum that God has set for you for this life. And everybody's going to be different. Everybody's got a different curriculum. So what Musar does is it gives you a way of inventorying what you are, what your strengths and weaknesses are, and most of you, by the way, will have far more strengths than you have weaknesses. If you were not sitting here in this room, I would suggest that a lot of you might have more weaknesses than strengths. But you've already come a long way. You've already recognized that God has a reason for you. You've already recognized that you have a place in God's kingdom. You've already formed a desire to figure out what it is God wants you to do. So you're miles ahead of people who don't have those insights. Having said that, I am sure that everybody here has got things that they want to make better about themselves. I certainly do. And what Musar does is gives you a way of figuring out what your strengths and weaknesses are 
and then gives you a structured program to help you work on the things that you want to improve. Now, as I said last week when I was giving the sermon, the reason the Jews are in exile right now, they've been in exile three times. The reason they're in exile right now is because of baseless hatred. And the rabbis recognize this, and they say, the reason we got thrown out of the pool is we couldn't get along with each other. And we couldn't get along with each other for reasons that are cosmically not important at all. Too many scorpions in one bottle. So what they have been doing, at least for the last thousand years, is they have been working actively on figuring out how they can correct the problems that got them sent into exile. Because remember, exile is therapeutic. God sends you into exile to a place that will correct the thing that got you sent there. And my favorite example is exile into Babylon was because of idolatry. And God says, fine, you guys want to do idolatry? We'll do idolatry. We'll send you to Idol Central. And they sent them to Babylon. And when they came out of Babylon, idolatry had been wrung out of their system. So what's being wrung out of their system now is this baseless hatred. And so, okay, you want to do baseless hatred? Fine. We'll do pogroms. We'll do the Holocaust. We'll do anti-Semitism. We'll teach you all about baseless hatred. You know, Jews are not stupid. And so, they, huh, that's why we're here. I guess we better figure out how to fix this. Musar is part of that reaction. So, one of the things to understand is the imperfections that you have in your makeup that you were born with. Anybody have children? One of, the, one of my favorite stories is Kay and I had Matthew, and the question was whether we should have started earlier or waited later or something like that, and I said to her, if we'd started earlier or waited until later, we wouldn't have Matthew. And she says, what? We had a kid. And then when we got Daniel, she understood what I meant. Because Daniel is very much not Matthew. And Catherine is very much not Daniel or Matthew. Each one of them came into the world very different people. And those of you who have children recognize the phenomenon. They're very different people. You know, one of them is headstrong. The other one is whatever. And the imperfections that you are born with are not sinful. Those imperfections, however, may cause you to sin. The imperfection itself is not sinful. The behavior that that imperfection may generate in you could be. So the idea that you are somehow some sort of a cosmic worm that you just can't imagine why anybody would care about you or why God would have even bothered to create you is just nonsense. He created you because he wanted you. He created you imperfect on purpose. Those imperfections then give you something to keep yourself entertained on your trip to the next world. And what you should be doing is working on those things as you go along. Musar then gives you a method systematically to handle that. Now, one of the things that self-help books and everything else try and teach you is how to manage the things that you don't like about yourself. Musar doesn't do that. What Musar is trying to do is change you so those impulses no longer exist. Big difference. And when we get to architectural diagrams here, I'll explain that so that it makes sense. One of the things to understand is Musar is not something that you know, it's something that you do. And again, that will make sense as we get into the course more. But the other thing to understand is this is not self-help. Bookstores are full of self-help books. That's not what we're doing here. What we're doing is we are helping you learn how to get out of God's way. Because the things that are imperfect in you cause you to get in the way of what God wants to do with you and through you. If you get out of God's way, what you will discover is your life will, in fact, go better. So it's not that there's no benefit to you. It's just that's not the reason you're doing it. My favorite example, we have Bonita laying down here at Sabina's feet. If you pet Bonita starting at the tail and going that way, the hair just raises up and works against you. If you pet Benita from the head down, everything is nice and smooth and both of you enjoy it a whole lot more. And what Musar does is helps you, you know, pet the dog from the head down instead of from the tail up. And in that, your life will go better. 
but again, that's not the primary purpose of the exercises. And by the way, the book I am using is Everyday Holiness by Alan Marinus. You can get it on Amazon. We've got four or five copies back there. The traditional way that the rabbis have broken down the character traits that you're interested in are behind me. There are 13 of them. And for those out in tape land, I'll read them. Humility, gratitude, patience, honor, generosity, kindness, strength, tranquility, trust, enthusiasm, order, awareness, and truth. Now, this little diagram I've got set up, if you think of this box as a set of louvers, and the yellow space is transparent, and the light blue space is opaque. So you have God's light is trying to work through you. In other words, God wants to work through you to affect other people. And in this particular iteration of the diagram, humility is out of step. So if I were dealing with you and my humility was out of balance, I would be blocking the ability for you to see God through me because of my out of balance humility. Anybody ever heard, I would love to go to church except it's full of hypocrites? And of course the standard preacher line is there's always room for one more. But seriously, the fact that people don't walk according to what God advertises messes up their witness. So if I were a preacher, you know, if I ever get to be one, and I were preaching about tithing, and the only thing you guys could see is that he's got a boat payment due, then my message of tithing wouldn't be effective because my greed would be in the way. So the idea here is, and I'll show you the next slide, to get yourself lined up so that God can work through you. Now, notice I don't have everything centered. Not everything is nice and neatly in the middle. Which means that you can get out of God's way without being anything special. You don't have to get everything perfectly lined up to be useful. In my first one, humility was clear over to the left on the slider. Well, whatever that problem was with humility, you still have that tendency because you notice I've just moved it over a little bit. I haven't moved it over to the center. See, in the previous one, humility was clear over on the left. So that person has got a problem with humility. Now, that person has made enough of a correction so that he is not in God's way anymore. But notice, I haven't centered it up. He's still got tendencies in that direction. That's something, at least at this point, that whoever this mythical person is, to go work on something else. Now, the other thing to understand... It is situational. So, go back to generosity, which is one of the ones in the middle. If I were a preacher, and I were preaching on tithing, and you all knew I had a boat payment due, and that I was really greedy for money, my witness would be flawed. If I were dealing with you, however, and I were not dealing with you on a matter of money, the fact that I am not generous wouldn't be a factor. But as you got to know me, you would soon find out that I wasn't generous. So at some point it'll kick in. But understand that this lining up of the louvers, as I say, is situational. So you want to be discerning about how you go about your life and recognize what your strengths and weaknesses are. The idea is not so that you can be better for you. The idea here is so you can be better so that you are a more useful instrument in God's hands. And as I say, if you don't treat people like they were dirt and you were arrogant, you'll find that your life also goes better, in addition to having a better witness. I'm not saying there's nothing in it for you, but I am saying the reason we're doing it is for God. Right. If you go to that web article that I was showing you on my website, this is where we're starting. Matthew was talking this morning about body, soul, and spirit. And if you have been around Christianity very long, have heard body, soul, and spirit, right? We're going to change that up a little bit. The little cloud there out there is the spiritual world, God, you know, whatever you want. And your spirit is the part of you that connects to God. Of course, the soul in Christian theology is mind, will, and emotions. And of course, the body is the clay, right? It's uh, okay, but it's imperfect. I'm going to rename them in Hebrew, first off. 
These are all biblical terms. And in fact, you can find them in Genesis 2 as God creates us. And what it says is God takes the clay, forms it into a body, breathes into it the breath of life, and man became a living being. So neshama is the part that we call spiritual. That's the parts that the image of God. That's the part of you that connects to God. Okay? And what we did when we disobeyed in the garden is we fuzzed up that white arrow. Our connection isn't as good as it used to be or as it's expected to be. And, of course, one of the things that I believe we'll have in the resurrection is that connection will be restored in the way that it is designed to be so that our connection with God becomes strong like it's supposed to be. In between is the nephesh. And, by the way, all of these nephesh, neshama, and ruach are all variously translated as breathe, air, breath, in scripture. But the Hebrew is different. And then on the bottom is the Ruach. And you'll see the Holy Spirit is the Ruach HaKodesh. It's also translated as divine wind in some of your Bibles. So what I've done is I've taken body, soul, and spirit, and I've broken it out and given it Hebrew names because they're going to be important. So now the next thing we're going to do is further refine it. And notice I've got this little box around the nephesh, and I've added a box called conscious and a ruach, and that's what I've labeled the soul. So notice we've still got body, soul, and spirit, just like we did before. The neshama is the spirit, and then I have the soul. I've got three things going on inside this box called the soul, and then we've got the body, which is the clay. The neshama is your connection to God. That's the image of God that's eternal and holy. The body, of course, is the clay. Looking at the Ruach, the Ruach is what I call a hardware abstraction layer. When you write computer code, you've got little bits and bytes that are doing all stuff, you write your logic. But somewhere there's got to be something that sends an electrical impulse to the printer that says, make a P. Normal programmers don't write that stuff. That's what's written at lower level code, and unless you are a lower level code writer, you don't write that stuff. You write higher levels. So the Ruach is the level that handles, oh, I want my hand to move. 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 Talking to you, move. Notice nothing's happened. Now my hand just flipped. I have no idea what happened there. All I know is I can make my hand flip over like that anytime I want to, but I have no idea how that works. Because there's a whole bunch of muscles that are firing and the balance of your muscles has to be just right. Typing, for example, you got all sorts of stuff going on there. And if you had to think about that, you'd never get anything done. All sorts of stuff is going on inside of you. That is all handled by the Ruach. So the Ruach's job is to take, oh, I want to move my hand and translate that into various muscles doing whatever they do. I don't have to think about it. So that's the Ruach. The Nephish... I've got broken into two parts, one of which is I've labeled the conscious, and the other one I've labeled the unconscious, and we'll talk about that in the next slide a little more. Notice I've relabeled the nephesh and the conscious. And the conscious is what you think you believe, and the nephesh is what you actually believe. Now, the Jews have a saying, don't tell me what you believe. Let me watch you for a while, and I'll tell you what you believe. So the nephesh is the place where what you actually believe resides. The conscious is the part that you have access to. That's what you think, plot, and ponder with. So as I'm talking here, I'm using my conscious mind, and my ruach is doing stuff too, right? I'm waving my hands here. But my conscious mind is the part of me that is thinking about what I'm going to say next, has thought about what I'm going to write down, has all that kind of stuff. Let me give you some examples of what the nephesh does. Now, for those of you who go into this book, which is excellent, I recommend it, the Jews have two phrases that are going to be important. One is the yetzer hara, and the other one is the yetzer to. Yetzer hara is the evil inclination. Yetzer tov is the good inclination. The rabbinical line, with which I actually agree, is, remember, God created everything and then he said it was very good? What they said is, 
the place where he said it was very good is when he created the Yetzer Hara, the evil inclination. And by the way, it's something that God created. You can't get rid of it. The evil inclination is the thing that causes you to start a family, to start a business, to get off your blessed assurance and go do stuff. It is the part of you that's active in the world and so forth, but it's also the part of you that wants its own way. That's why they call it the evil impulse, because it is the thing that gives you impulses to do stuff that you don't want to do. Let's use an example here. And I've used this before. Many of you have heard it, but those, a lot of you haven't. Anybody ever been to a swimming pool in the summer? Anybody ever seen a little kid watching people go off the high dive? Ooh, that looks fun. Anybody ever seen that little kid walk up to the top of the high dive, get to the end, and freeze? You all recognize what I'm talking about, don't you? So as you're down on the ground watching everybody go off the high dive and just laughing and having all sorts of fun, I want to go do that. That's your conscious mind. You get up on top of the high dive and you look down and your nephew says, we're not going to move because if you go off the end of that, you're going to die. We're not going to do this. That's your nephew. That's what you truly believe versus what you thought you believed when you were standing down on the ground. So as you're standing there at the end of the diving board, you got two choices. One is get down on your hands and knees, crawl back, and go down and have everybody laugh at you. I've seen that done. The other one is death before dishonor. And off you go. Because the other thing that your nephew won't let you do is it won't let you be ridiculed. So there's this tension there. On the one hand, I don't want to die. And on the other hand, I don't want anybody to laugh at me either. And depending on which one of those wins, you either go off the high dive or you come back down the stairs. But that entire conversation is taking part in your nephesh. And your nephesh will literally lock your muscles up if it needs to, to keep you from doing something like that. The problem that we have, and, and we're going to treat the nephesh like it was a problem. It is not a problem. It's something God created. And what the nephesh is, is your source of stability. That's the thing that keeps you from going off in all directions is your nephesh, because that's the residence of your self-image. My self-image is, I'm brave and I'm strong and I'm not afraid of going off that diving board. The rest of me says, wait a minute, if you do that, you're going to die. But the point is, your nephesh is where your self-image resides. And changing your self-image is what Musar is all about. And we're going to teach you how to do that. Now, notice I've also added some more arrows here in my little diagram. And I've got sort of wimpy little yellow arrows going from the conscious either to the neshama or the ruach. And I've got big, heavy, honking arrows going from the nephesh to the neshama and the ruach. So, you are able to communicate with your body. In other words, I am able to move my hand. I'm able to communicate with my body. The yellow arrows are what I would call willpower. So, let's say I wanted to lose five pounds. I'm not going to eat for a while. In fact, when I need to lose five pounds, the easiest way for me to do that is to go on a three or four day fast. Because I can do no food. What I can't do is reduced food. I need to lose my five pounds. And if I try and reduce my food, I'm operating on a yellow arrow. And what's going to happen is I'm going to get bored or I'm going to get a little bit hungry and I say, oh, you know, I was really pretty good yesterday. So um, maybe today an extra slice of pie would be okay because I was really good yesterday. And eventually I'm back where I started. It's the same thing with prayer. So I can pray, and that's my little yellow arrow. I'm praying in my conscious. And that's good to do. It's okay. But over here in my nephesh, what my nephesh is going to do is I have got habits that I have formed over a lifetime. And my nephesh, which is my source of stability, is going to keep me doing those habits unless I change them. And my wimpy little yellow arrow from the conscious is not going to overcome that big heavy red arrow from my nephesh over time. 
In other words, I can reduce it one time and re- refuse the piece of pie for dessert today. I can do that once or twice. But over a period of a month, that big, heavy red arrow is going to prevail. So the problem we've got here is how do we change what the nephish believes so that that red arrow is working for us instead of working against us? Remember in the previous slide, the purpose of Massar is not to control your impulses, it's to change your impulses. And if I change that red arrow, what I've done is I've changed what my habits are So I no longer have to exercise willpower to do it because that's now just part of who I am. Now going north on my arrow here, it's what you really believe. So you can pray for anything you want. You can read the Bible and you can pray for anything you want. But much of what you pray for, you don't really expect to have happen. And that's what Yeshua means when he says, if you had faith as a mustard seed, you would be able to say to the sycamine tree, move, and it would remove itself to the sea. In other words, if you can get your faith operating on those big, heavy, thick red arrows, the things that you pray for will come to being because you truly believe they will. As opposed to, I just read in the Bible somewhere, and it says, well, healing's okay, but I don't really believe it. So I'm doing the prayers, but I'm not really expecting any results. And that's the difference between operating on this skinny yellow arrow as opposed to operating on that big, heavy red arrow. One of the stories that I tell about myself, I got a hold of this years and years ago with respect to colds. I don't do colds anymore. Now, that doesn't mean that colds don't try and come on me. They do. But every time I get a cold, I go into the bathroom and I look at myself in the mirror and I say, you are not going to be sick. And I believe it. And I don't get a cold. Actually, I do, but it lasts about 24 hours. <laughs> the whole process just whoosh, and goes through and is gone. And never very bad. Because I don't believe colds are for me. In my nephish. Not in my conscious mind. And so, getting your nephish lined up so that it operates in accordance with what God would have you be, all of a sudden makes all sorts of things really simple. Let's go on. Let's figure out what the problem is with convincing your nephish. I've got two axes here. Right and wrong and true and false. Notice right and wrong are on one axis, true and false are on a different axis. They're orthogonal. Your conscious mind operates on the basis of right and wrong. That's wrong. You shouldn't do that. That's the right thing to do. All those kinds of things. Your nephish doesn't care about right and wrong. What your nephish cares about is true and false. Is it true of me that I am a generous person? If it is true of me that I am a generous person, then I will give you freely. If it is not true of me that I am a generous person, I will find ways to sabotage my desire to give. Because according to my nephish, it is not true of me that I am generous. So the language of communicating with your nephish is very different than the language of communicating with your conscience. Your conscience operates on reason, logic, right and wrong, you know, all the kind of stuff that we're used to doing in our heads. That's your conscience. That works just fine there. Nephish don't care. Don't care about any of that stuff. You can tell your nephish all you want. This is wrong. You shouldn't be doing this. This is wrong. As you march along and do it. Anybody ever done something and said, I, I really don't want to be doing this. this. This isn't right. Anybody ever caught themselves in the middle of doing something that you just know that this is wrong? And you're crunching right along there and you're continuing to do it. That's because your nephish is what's controlling you. And it is true of you that whatever that behavior is, is something that you do. And the fact that your conscience is saying, wait a minute, stop, 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 this is wrong. Fish don't care. So let's take about 10 minutes, stretch your legs, and the next thing we'll talk about is how do you communicate with your nephew? Yeah, one other thing I neglected to mention earlier really belonged at the beginning, but I'll throw it in now. The imperfections that you have should form a curriculum for how you're going to conduct your life and how you're going to develop. And God has deliberately made life difficult. 
The fact that life is difficult is, again, it's a feature, not a bug. It's designed that way. You've got adversaries. You've got other people who are your adversaries. You've also got things like demons that are your adversaries. And the way I would describe it, I used to be in the Army. And one of the things that I used to just detest, I went through ranger school. And you would go out for a week on one meal a day, carrying everything that you've got through mud and the muck and the bugs. And it was just miserable. And it was designed to be miserable. And the idea was, if you make the training difficult enough and miserable enough, there used to be a saying, that the Roman training was bloody, so that their battles looked like training. So the better trained you are, the better you are at navigating life, and the only way you get trained is through difficulty. So overcoming obstacles, fighting through things, all that kind of thing is part of the design of this life. God made it that way on purpose, because he's toughening you up for something. And again, what Musar does is, it's like when you're out in the woods with a map and a compass, you know, and you're out there, you can spend a whole lot of time going around a mountain, or you can spend a shorter amount of time going over it. And what you got to decide is which is going to be easier. Is it going to be easier to go over the mountain, short distance, or is it going to be easier to go the long way around the mountain? But if you know that those are your choices, you can make an intelligent choice. And that's what Musar gives you, is the ability to look at your situation and say, all right, do I want to go around this mountain, or do I want to go over it? Or do I want to turn on and go in another direction? That's another option. So understand that the difficulties that you're going through are part of the design. What Musar does is helps you make them not any more painful than they have to be. All right, onward. As I was saying at the end of the last segment, Nefesh doesn't work on right and wrong. Nefesh works on true and false. Uh, one other thing. Learn to watch what you're thinking about. Learn to think about what you're thinking about. For example, if I don't think I should do something, but as Ray says, I really, 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 really want to do it, what I will do is spend, oh, an hour or so convincing myself why it isn't really so bad in this case, justifying what I'm about to do, even though I know it's wrong. Roman says the things that I, I know I should do, I don't do. The things I know I shouldn't do, I do. He's talking about this right here. The idea that he knows what's right and wrong, but what he wants overrides his understanding of what's right and wrong. And one of the things that I have learned, which has helped me a lot, is to watch myself think. So that when I go into one of these little justification routines, I can watch what I'm doing. I say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I see what you're doing here. And instead of being carried along by it, I can choose then to interrupt it. And by the way, I do not always so choose. You know, sometimes I just keep right on going and blowing through the safeguard. But learn to set a watch. And, and that's what the Bible calls take every thought captive. Everything I'm talking about here is in the Bible. It's all biblical. But it's spread out over a thousand pages. What I'm trying to do is just take that part of it and condense it for you. I'm not talking about anything here that's not biblical. Romans, Paul has the same dilemma. So, take every thought captive is the process of thinking about what you're thinking about. Watch what's going on in your mind. Get used to that. The conscious is where we operate all the time. The nephish is far more powerful. And it's more difficult to communicate with. And what I'm going to talk about next is how do you talk to this thing and get it to change what it believes about you or about itself, since it is you. How does the nephish decide what is true of you? And the most commonly useful five things, and by the way, these are all biblical. The first one is authority. And I will again use a story I've used lots of times. Your mother and father, as you were a child, represent the authority in your life. So when they tell you something, you believe it. Where's that in the Bible? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. He is speaking as an authority. 
What he's doing is he's speaking to the nephesh. My mother, she had bad teeth. She was just rabid that we would all brush our teeth. To this day, I cannot go to bed with unbrushed teeth. I'm serious. The last thing I do is I get up and brush my teeth because I know I will not be able to go to sleep if I don't do that. So the authority that was my mother welded in me, you brush your teeth before you go to bed. Another example, you all listen to the radio, I'm assuming, every now and then, if nothing else, in the car. And you'll be driving along and they'll say, four out of five doctors recommend that you do X, Y, or Z. That's an appeal to authority. What they're trying to do is bypass your conscious mind and plant their product in your nephesh so that you want it. That's what that's attempting to do. They are trying to bypass your conscious mind and communicate with your nephesh directly. And they're using authority to do that. Emotion is the same way. Your nephesh responds to emotion. I'll tell you a story about cats. You know, you can actually train a cat. Every time we have a cat, the first thing that they want to do is jump up on the kitchen counter. Right? I don't like cats on the kitchen counter. Now, I am six foot three, approaching 190 pounds. So when the kitten jumps up on the counter, I go, big, loud noise, and sweep it off onto the floor. Cat lands on its feet, never comes near the kitchen counter again. (laughs) Because what I have done is I have gone straight to the emotions of that cat. I have communicated emotionally to that cat that being on the kitchen counter is not something that you want to do because it's really dangerous. Another example. Let's say you're in third or fourth grade and you have to give a book report. And you have to stand up in front of the third or fourth grade and give your book report. And let's say you read a book that isn't very popular and everybody laughs at you. I will guarantee you that for the rest of your life, every time you stand up in front of a crowd to give a presentation, your stomach will nod up because of emotion. Your nephesh has recognized because of that negative emotion, speaking in front of a group of people is dangerous to me. I don't want to do that. By the way, all of these ways of communicating with the nephesh is things that we are going to teach you how to do to affect your nephesh doing things that you want it to do. Nephesh just responds, it doesn't analyze. The analysis goes on in the conscious mind. So you get to decide what you want your nephesh to be doing, and then you get to use these techniques to communicate with it so that it then becomes part of who you are, and you don't have to think about it anymore. All right, next one is images. Anybody here play golf? One of the things that professional golfers do is as they're standing over a shot, they close their eyes and they visualize what they want that shot to do. They'll visualize it till they have it welded in their mind, and they'll open their eyes, and they'll make the shot. The reason I don't play golf is because I think about it. Ray was trying to teach me to sing, and one of the things he noticed is I was thinking about it instead of just singing. Screws you up when you want to play golf. Screws you up when you want to play basketball. When you get ready to make the shot, when you get ready to dribble, when you get ready to hit your drive, you don't want to think. You just want muscle memory to take over and your body to do what it's been trained to do. If you think about what you want to do, you get in your own way. Hence, what the golfer or a baseball player or any professional athlete will do is they'll stop. The sports announcers call it focusing. But what they're really doing is in their mind, They are visualizing what that next thing is going to be and what it's going to look like. And then when they open their eyes, their body just does it. Those are images. And again, your nephesh doesn't know whether it's actual images or images you're generating. It just takes images. So again, generating images to do what you want to do is a very powerful technique. Hearing. Faith comes by hearing by the Word of God. Okay? Hearing is very powerful. Sound is far more powerful than sight, even though sight is the facility we actually use the most. That's why AM radio, which was invented a century and a half ago, is still going strong because it sells soap. You hear. And so that hearing goes right in and goes right to your nephesh. That's how they create desire for products. That's how they create 
all those kinds of things as it goes into your ears. The most powerful and authoritative voice that you have is your own voice. So instead of thinking something, my example with colds that I just gave, I don't sit around thinking, gee, I don't want to have a cold. Gee, I wish I didn't have a cold. Gee, I don't want a cold. Gee, I want to be healed from I don't think about that. What I do is I go into the bathroom, I look in the mirror, and I say in a very firm, authoritative voice, you will not be sick. Because my voice then goes into my ears, and my nephish then picks up on my voice, which is authoritative, and my nephish then makes the necessary adjustments to get rid of the stupid virus. So hearing is really important. And then the final thing that's important is repetition. If you want to change a habit, you have got to do something different for a period of time. Because as your nephish gets used to doing it, it will say, oh, that's what we do now. And off you'll go. A good habit is just as hard to break as a bad habit. Witness brushing my teeth. We all have bad habits that we want to get rid of. And the way to get rid of that is to replace it with a good habit, but you need to repeat for a while before it becomes yours. So anyway, those are the ways that you communicate with your nephish. Now, the question is becomes, what do you want to communicate? The book here will talk about some of these. Visualization, that's one I just talked about. Contemplation, that's where you wrestle with a thought, akin to meditation, but you know, you sit and figure out what it is you want to do and you wrestle with it for a while. And you need to do that again consistently. Chant is extremely powerful. And one of the things that we'll do during this course is we'll give you some phrases to repeat. And the phrases that we give you are suggestions. There's nothing magic about any of them. But as you go through each of the Mido, the measurements, there will be a phrase that it is suggested that you might use. If you don't like the phrase, get another one. There isn't anything magic about it. It's simply a phrase. And this Bussar course will have a suggested phrase at the end of each of the Mido. Let's use humility, since that was what we're talking about. Humility is an aspect of pride. So on one end is arrogance. On the other end is self-abasement. Those are two ends of the same character trait. So if you are toward the arrogance end, the thing that you want to repeat is, I am but dust and ashes. That will bring you back down toward the middle, which is where you want to be. If you're on the lower end, where you think you are but dust and ashes, what you want to do is repeat, the universe was created for me, so that will help you move toward the pride end. They're designed to help you move in a direction that you need to go. And in order to figure out which one you need, you need to figure out which one you are. So what you're going to do is what is called the accounting of the soul. And what you want to find out is what you really believe. Remember I had in the nephish box was labeled what you really believe? I will tell you that most of the world spends most of its time deceiving itself about what it really believes. Our conscious mind is able to read things and read scripture and all those kinds of things, and we know what we're supposed to be. And that's what we try and convince ourselves that we are. We're not. So what you want to do is you want to get down into your nephish and you want to find out what you actually are, what you actually believe, because then you can design a program or a curriculum to change it. Notice how I said that. Most of you in many of these measurements are just fine. You don't need to change anything. And that's good to know also. Good to know where you need to change, but it's also good to know where you don't need to change. And as I say, the fact that you are all sitting in here and most of you are mature believers is an indication that there's a whole bunch about each of you that is just fine. So as we go through each of one of these things, don't approach it with the idea that, oh my gosh, am I screwed up here? Because you may not be. So, this last bullet. Your behavior exposes what your nephish believes. By definition, the unconscious is unconscious. You don't have access to it. So you can't think about 
and rummage around in there. You've got to watch what you do for a period of time, and then based on what you do for a period of time, you can then figure out what your nephesh actually believes. These 13 attributes will be referred to in the book, for those of you who are using the book, as medot. And medot literally means measurement. So as you look at somebody who is somewhat out of balance, in the first bar, I've got humility is radically out of balance. Notice I have not labeled the end points of those bars. I did that on purpose. So one end of humility, as we said before, is arrogance. The other end of humility is abasement. It isn't clear which way this person is out of balance. This could be a person that has a real bad self-esteem problem, or it could be a person that has a really bad pride problem, depending on how you label the axes. For gratitude and patience and honor, this guy's in pretty good shape. Doesn't need to do a whole lot of work on those because he's reasonably in balance. Generosity. This person could be stingy, or this person could be foolish with his money. So at one end is somebody who's got the first penny he ever earned, and then on the other end is a person who can't keep his hands on any money because he just gives it all away all the time. Neither one is healthy. And I haven't labeled it, but this person has some kind of a problem with generosity. Kindness, same kind of thing. There are people who are not kind, but there are also people who are so kind that they are damaging to other people. So going back to my army example, I used to run a battalion. If I was too kind to my soldiers, they would never get trained. And so were I to take them into battle untrained, they would then get defeated and killed. So my kindness, not training them the way they should be trained, is in fact a fault. Same thing with raising children. God made them with a bumper. And periodically you need to swat them on that bumper to get their attention and get them pointed back in the right direction. Failing ever to do that is an excess of kindness. Your kindness is out of balance. You can't bring yourself to discipline your children. The other part of that is you are so strict that your children wind up hating you by the time they're 20. That's not good either. So all of these things have a range, and what you want to be is somewhere in the middle of that range, not on either extreme. Tranquility. This person could be somebody who's agitated. You ever sit near somebody that can make a cup of coffee nervous? The other one is you can't ever get off your blessed assurance because you just sort of lump. Neither one is healthy. Trust, enthusiasm, order. There are people like me who never saw a horizontal surface he didn't want to lay things down on. My wife has learned not to have horizontal surfaces around because I'll put stuff on them. If something gets put away in a drawer, as far as I'm concerned, it's gone out of the universe. It doesn't exist anymore. But I am disorderly. That's one I need to work on personally. There is, the, on the other end, the neat freak. You know, Felix Unger, the odd couple. So anyway, what we're going to do now, for this next week... What we're going to do is what's called tikkun medut nefesh, which means repair of the measurements of the nefesh. Tikkun is repair. Midot is measurements of the nefesh. That's the program. So what I want you to do is think about yourself this week. And, you know, set aside a little bit of time before you go to bed, when you get up, you know, whenever your time to think about things is. Think about you and consider some areas where you would like to improve. And write down some of them. And what we'll do next time, for those of you who are in the book, we'll start. The book is organized in three parts. Part one is some of the stuff that I have gone over today using different terms. And it's sort of an introduction to the book and so forth. Part two is the medote. That's the little slatted thing that I showed you. And he has a chapter in part two on each one of the medot. And then part three is techniques and exercises on how to change your medot. I've sort of combined all those in this introductory period. So those of you who are in the book, read the first part. Read the part on humility, which is the first one we're going to do. And we'll talk about humility next time and we'll talk about some things that you can do and, and so forth with humility. 
and generally speaking, we'll take one of those chapters a week. And the technique will be read the chapter, think about it. There are several techniques that you can use. One is you can start keeping a diary. So what you'll be asked to do is you'll be asked to use a phrase. And one we gave you from humility is either I am but dust and ashes or the universe was created for me. Those are two suggestions. You don't like either one of them? Pick two of your own. It's okay. And what you'll do is you'll start the day or end the day, depending again on what your temperament is, and you'll repeat that phrase, perhaps chanting it, and at the end of the day, sit down and write down your observations with respect to that trait. And what you'll find at the end of the week is you will find how you have behaved with respect to that trait, and you'll just be able to decide whether you like it or not. And this goes back to my suggestion that you set a watch over what you're thinking. So what you'll be doing is you'll be paying attention to what you're doing and what you're thinking. And at the end of the day, take a few minutes and write down your observations. First week will be with respect to humility. How did I do at work? How did I do interacting with people? With respect to that measurement. And at the end of the week, you'll be able to look at that and say, that's actually pretty good. Or you look at it and say, that's something I need to work on. And understand that as you go through this, this is not to condemn you. If you find areas that you need to work on, and you will, this is not to make you feel guilty because you're an arrogant SOB or you're somebody who's a worm. Not to make you feel guilty. It's to make you understand that that is something you need to work on, and then you can start a program to correct it. Because remember, I said that the measurements themselves are not simple, but the character traits that those things measure may lead you to sin if they're not correct. Don't start humility this week. Read humility so we can talk about it, and then you'll do humility the week after. This week, I just want you to think about thinking. Practice setting a watch over your thoughts. Think about things about yourself that you are dissatisfied with, and lay those out on the measurements that I've shown. And understand, each one of those measurements has two ends. Being in the ditch on the left side is no better than being in the ditch on the right side. You're still in the ditch. Where you want to be is in the middle. That's why I deliberately didn't label the ends of those, because being off on one end is just as bad as being off on the other end.